Alaska Native culture in several communities. Uh, and then uh, Karen Ashton and Steve Okinen are going to provide a presentation on a research project that they've been working on for a number of years that looks at um, the drivers of feeding hotspots for bowhead whales. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, welcome Craig George to give us our first presentation. Thank you all so much for making time to um, speak with us today. Good morning, everyone. See, I'll wait for the first slide, but yeah, my name is Craig George. I live in Utkiagovic, uh, Alaska, formerly Barrow. I was a wildlife biologist here for 40 years and am now retired, but I was deeply involved in bowhead whale science in the community uh, science as well. And um, so that'll be the topic of this talk is sort of the integration of, of let's say Western science and uh, community science in this area and how, how we use that in the bowhead research program. So um, yeah, advance to the next slide. So here's an overview of the whaling communities. There's 11 active whaling communities in Alaska. There are several, many in, in Chukotka as well. Typically they don't take many bowheads. Uh, they maybe take one a year on average. The average harvest on the Alaskan side is about 40 animals a year. Stretching from St. Lawrence Island to Koktovik in Alaska, next. Next slide, please. So here's a generalized migration pattern. And uh, this is basic, essentially based on telemetry data from a satellite tagging program we conducted with, in collaboration with the community and funded through BOEM. But it shows the wintering area and the bearing and then uh, moving up through uh, along the Arctic coast into the Canadian Arctic. And uh, the interesting, and then the reverse migration and the fall back down into the bearing. But the interesting thing is that the, uh, the migration intersects at Point Barrow. So it's one of the few villages that has both a spring and a fall hunt. Uh, now there is a spring and fall hunt uh, pretty consistently in St. Lawrence Island, but that wasn't the case uh, years ago. And so that has implications later. We'll hear from uh, Karen and Steve about uh, that aspect. Uh, next. Trying to move quickly through these. So, so the bowhead harvest at Barrow is really significant. Half the US harvest of bowheads are taken here at Utkiagovic. And in recent decades, uh, when the quota increased, half of the that harvest occurred in the fall hunt. There's a spring and fall hunt and roughly half the animals, sometimes more are taken in the fall, like this year. Uh, and then uh, Barrow's part of this incredible sharing network in the native communities and, and well uh, products are distributed to a lot of different villages um, around the state. So, so it, it's an extremely important uh, place, not only to the, this village, but many others in terms of the sharing network. Next. Next slide, yeah. And so I wanna emphasize here, there's a long history of, of science and integration of traditional knowledge at Utkiagovic. It stretches back the early days during the Franklin search and uh, Roqueford, McGuire, these nice journals published by uh, John Boxdos are really interesting. Um, three years at Point Barrow, they documented uh, weather records, what was happening in the village, all sorts of things, sea ice records. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of inter uh, interaction with the big community at Nuvok at Point Barrow at the time. Then of course, the International Polar Year and the Ray Expedition at Point Barrow in this uh, amazing uh, volume by John Murdoch, um, super detailed, really one of the most successful Arctic expeditions and 
I've heard you don't hear about it because it was successful and nothing went wrong. Yeah. And then uh, a more recent, this is uh, 1950s, uh, Mammals of Northern Alaska was published and that is full of local knowledge uh, from various people around the slope about uh, mammal distribution, and this sort of thing. But um, then it seemed to go quiet for a while uh, next. And it seemed like there was less integration. Um, well, that's not entirely true. At NARO, that same collaboration existed. Um, and then a, a significant event happened in 1977. Many of you know that's when the International Whaling Commission imposed the uh, whaling moratorium because there were no reliable population estimates of the bowhead and they were concerned about the hunt. The moratorium was passed, but that was essentially the birth of the AW, Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. The research intensified and then in an unusual um, situation that the North Slope Borough actually sort of gained the responsibility for the bowhead program starting in 1981. So, um, all this sort of spurred the birth of our department next. And our sort of flagship project was the Bowhead Abundance work called the Bowhead Whale Census at Point Barrow. It was started in 78 by NOAA and NIMFS, but uh, conducted from 1981 to present by our department. And it was a nice integration we used uh, local knowledge to design the study and make sure that we were dealing for what, you know, accounting for whales swimming under the sea ice and far offshore and all these things to make a more reliable abundance estimate. So, uh, and, and that we sort of, from this almost singular project, we branched into a whole number of other fields. Next, uh, next slide. So in, you can see a lot of the work that the North Slope Borough Wildlife Department has done on this nice website that Leslie Pierce put together. And um, we've branched into both terrestrial and marine mammal research and fisheries work and a number of other things. And the basic idea is to provide uh, reliable data for estimating sustainable harvest levels and, and working closely with the communities Next. And so that's a lead into the, the Bowfest project, the Bowhead Whale Feeding Study at Point Barrow. And we'll hear more detail in a moment about this, but this was a, a nice integrated study and the North Slope Borough had a large part in it and a number of other researchers from Woods Hole to Point Barrow. And, uh, we, uh, next slide, uh, locally, we ran uh, local boat surveys. And uh, these, uh, here's an example of a survey in 2010, but we had a total of 650 bowhead sightings over the several years of the study, 500 gray whale sightings and almost 14 hours, 1400 hours of, of total boat time and uh, really, uh, put together a nice picture of when and where bowheads are distributed starting in uh, actually in August. And there's always a trickle of bowheads here early before the main migration begins. And it was, um, I was thinking about, <laughs> really need to publish this. This is in that volume you just saw, but um, it was, uh, it was a really a nice integration of, of uh, local hunters doing the survey work and uh, scientific work. Next. And as part of that, um, we, we documented these, we'll hear more about this, these krill wash ups. When the krill is evicted to the area, sometimes it's washed ashore. And during these events, uh, typically the bowheads are feeding near shore. And one of the reasons Point Barrow is such a, a um, productive whale hunting area is because it's a feeding area as well and it attracts bowheads and typically 
the bowheads are more approachable uh, by the hunters when they're feeding. So all these things sort of come together and make barrow this uh, incredibly important uh, uh, area for both bowhead feeding and bowhead whale hunting in the autumn. Next. So this is a, and here's another one. This was a remarkable uh, krill wash up that happened uh, this year in September. And uh, the, the krill were ankle deep. There were, you know, just incredible quantities. And I should have stuck in the aerial survey slide next. I, I'm just in the interest of time, I left it out, but no, go, go to the former slide. But, um, but the aerial surveys saw a lot of bowheads right near shore this year as well. Sort of um, in primarily, uh, you know, the bowheads were targeting these krill and feeding next. And so this is a typical bowhead stomach, uh, this full of uh, euphalsids, which is a principal prey here at Point Barrow. We'll hear more about why in a minute from uh, Karen and Steve, but uh, at uh, 80 or 90% of the whales that are harvested have been feeding at the time of harvest at Point Barrow. And interestingly, next slide to the east, uh, bowheads primarily feed on, on uh, copepods. Uh, so the krill usually aren't infected that far east. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that in a moment. But this is a typical st stomach of a whale harvested Koktovik, and you can see uh, this remarkable sample uh, to the right, the Gay Sheffield uh, collected, and you can see the lipid has settled out. This is whale jet fuel, we call it. That's uh, really an important food item. So next. So in terms of energetics, uh, this area is, is really important uh, energetically for bowheads, they, they do a lot of topping off, let's say, uh, prior to the, the winter uh, at Point Barrow and along the Chukotka coast. Um, I also wanted to mention that a lot of the telemetry work, the satellite telemetry collaborative study that we've done with the native community has occurred here. Again, for that reason, the whales are accessible uh, logistics at Barrow is is pretty good. And so in this very nice study done by uh, Lori Question, Bush, Sitta, and a whole host of others, you can see there a lot of local names, Harry Brower, Mary Mara Brower, Billy Adams, Lewis Brower. Sorry, I'm really trying to hurry here. So. Um, and some guys from Canada as well, uh, James and Charlie. Pokiak uh, really put together a pretty remarkable uh, study. I think uh, about 100 whales tagged over a 10 year period. Next. And one of the outcomes of this study, the next slide is uh, John analyzed the data and was able to determine the areas most were feeding, uh, let's say the feeding hotspots used by bowheads. Based, this is based on telemetry, but it, it fits nicely with most aerial surveys. There's a few, uh, few exceptions, but this is where bowheads spend a lot of time and exhibit dive behavior. And you can see that Point Barrow is one of the six hot spots identified in this telemetry work. It's a very nice paper by Sita et al. Uh, published in Progress in Oceanography. So next, uh, and a lot of this is summarized in, <laughs> in uh, a book that was just published uh, by Elsevier, The Bowhead Whale. So this is a, a little plug for the book that we uh, finally completed. And uh, Karen and Steve were both co-authors in this as well. Uh, next, and yeah, just a couple words that there's a long history of science and local involvement here at Utkiavik, and uh, this area is extremely important uh, for s subsistence, 
cultural and nutritional subsistence and well feeding. Um, and I guess part of my message is that local knowledge and science has a syn synergistic effect when, when it's conducted together. And uh, TK, traditional knowledge, it's really useful for designing studies like we did in the uh, Bowhead Abundance Surveys here at Point Barrow. And uh, just in terms of community science, for those of you working in the Arctic uh, or getting started there, uh, get involved in the community and develop that trust and then always remember to give something back. Uh, that's kind of how you, you sort of enter the Inupiat sharing network or the native sharing network when you do science up here. And if you're, if you're using their knowledge, make sure that um, you give it back. And I know Karen and Steve have been great about that, giving many, many presentations uh, locally. So next. And that is enough from me. And uh, thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, I think maybe we'll just take a couple of minutes and see if anyone has any pressing questions for Craig before we move on to our next speakers. And then we'll have time for discussion at the end uh, uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, Craig, this is Kathy Kuhn. And my question is, you know, you said you spent decades up in the Ukviagvik area. And, and how often do you see krill wash up? Is it, you know, regularly or like infrequently? I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's not with like every three years or something with a certain amount of. Yeah, that's a good question. And I should have assembled that. I, I do keep notes on these uh, sorts of events and it it is intermittent. And I would say, uh, Steve and Karen helped me here, but maybe one event every three or four years. But again, the there's no period to it. It's uh, it sort of randomly occurs. This year was, like I said, was really one of the most impressive I've ever seen. And uh, that was reflected in the whale distribution. And again, I should have added a, a slide done by uh, the aerial survey team, Megan Ferguson and his group, but uh, the whales were stacked along the beach on the uh, on the Plover Islands, the Topkala Islands to the east, and uh, really impressive. Is that does that answer your question? What uh, this is this is Steve here, Okanen, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn. Um, actually, we have a slide later in our presentation. It uh, kind of looks like that, uh, depending on what the fall winds are prior to in the preceding year, um, is somewhat correlated with whether there's a, a krill wash up in say July or early August. It's related to the life stage of the, the uh, krill that you see. Generally, they tend to be uh, juveniles and adults, um, larger krill. And, uh, but but yeah, Steve, there's, there's no period to it, right? It's... No, not necessarily. Yeah, okay. Other than you're right, it, typically it happens in August. And, well, we've had them as early as July, though. Yes, and yeah. and and what's controlling that? It looks like what's controlling that is what the winds are doing the previous fall. Ah, that's right. Interesting. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Exactly what we had fun also when we did the modeling with um, Leo Berlin. Uh, it was pretty much depending upon the the year before, indeed. Interesting. All right, well, I think we'll move on to our next presentation by Karen and Steve, and then we'll have uh, hopefully some time for discussion following their presentation as well. Okay, can you guys, everyone hear me? Yes, we can. All right, and... Okay, well, I can no longer see all of your smiling faces, but um, I can see my presentation. We can so, see anyway, you. <laughs> you can see it. Okay, good. Well, it was, it's great to, to see everybody and, um, and I, so many familiar faces and names and haven't seen any of you in a long time. But 
Um, yeah, today Steve and I are going to be telling you about our project that we call Exploring the Point Barra Bowhead Whale Feeding Hotspot. And I'd like to acknowledge our um, co-authors, Bob Campbell and Phil Alitalo. And also to point out that this project was conducted with many, many collaborators. And I listed a few of them along the bottom um, here. Um, and there's many more um, beyond them. But um, And this is a sort of familiar slide, but our research was really motivated by the observation that Craig pointed out that bowhead whales often linger in the fall near Point Barrow, uh, where they're available to be hunted by the Inupiat whalers. And so we originally set out to find out why the whales were, were stopping at this location. And the project was a field effort and it was ran over 11 years from 2005 until 2015. And our work was supported by a, a bunch of different funders, um, the National Science Foundation through the study of the North Alaska Coastal System and the Arctic Observing Network. The BOFEST project that Craig mentioned had a big long period of five year project. We also were supported through the National Oceanographic Partnership Program. And then in one year, we had additional support from the UAF Coastal Marine Institute, as well as the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Arctic Initiative. And we are very grateful to all of those funding entities for keeping, helping us keep up our work. So our work was motivated by um, the question of why do bowhead whales stop at Point Barrow and or Utkiagvik? And we hypothesized that they're stopping there because they could find dense patches of their krill prey at that location. And if that was true, we wanted to know how the patches formed, how the ocean conditions and the amount of whale prey might vary between the years, and what are the broad scale forcings that could drive interannual variability in what happens at Point Barrow. So to, 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 uh, for this field study, we did oceanographic surveys from August, mid-August to approximately mid-September. It varied by year, how long we were up there, over 11 years, from 2005 to 2015. We worked from a small research vessel, the Anaka Marie. We were based in Utkiagvik. And we did surveys um, along transects that were oriented orthogonal to the shelf, I mean, to the coast, excuse me, and extended across the shelf out into deeper water. Across the Beaufort Shelf, oh look, this does work. Across the Beaufort Shelf, as well as across Barrow Canyon, which runs um, from southwest to northeast, just off of Point Barrow. And these, each one of these dots shows the location of the station that we conducted. We conducted over 800 individual stations. I want to point out two more things. First of all, that the this our first line here is very close to the distributed biological observatory line five, and also that. Um, the Alaska Coastal Current runs from southwest to northeast, usually through Barrow Canyon, with its locational in the canyon varying according to the wind. And this current is a key component in the mechanism that um, drives the krill trap. So yes, we did find that, um, that bowhead whales stop at Barrow to feed on krill. And um, they do that because there is a bowhead whale feeding hotspot that forms there, We typically, which we uh, call the krill trap. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is walk you through the steps, the physical biological mechanisms that form, um, that are part of the krill trap and that form this feeding hotspot. And so I'm going to show you a series of a cartoons. They're all the same, but something, the same orientation. So we're standing in the Canada Basin looking towards Point Barrow. You can see the Beaufort Shelf here and the Chukchi Sea over here. Barrow Canyon runs um, along the, the coast next to Point Barrow. We also have um, the, the blue arrows indicate the location of the Alaska Coastal Current. The pink cloud is showing us uh, a, krill, a krill patch or a, a cloud of, pit of krill. We've got the wind man showing us wh which direction the wind is blowing and that the wind is blowing. And so in this case, he's blowing from the east. Um, and we've got some whales. And so when this little story starts, these whales are not on the shelf. They're off of the shelf as they're migrating past during their fall migration. So when the wind blows from the east, water and krill are upwelled onto the Beaufort shelf along the shelf break, probably through troughs or canyons, small canyons that um, bisect the shelf. Um, during this time, as I said, whales are not close to Point Barrow, but in the Alaska Coastal Current is on the western side of Barrow Canyon. Get this out of here. The wind continues to blow from the east and the water and the upwell krill move across the Beaufort Shelf towards the coast, getting closer to Point Barrow. Um, the whales are still offshore. 
the Alaska Coastal Current is still on the western side of the canyon. The wind continues to blow from the east and that cloud of krill has now moved to Point Barrow and is going around Point Barrow and moving into the Chukchi Sea where Craig has observed the krill many times being washed up on the shores along the beaches there. So um, at this point, the whales might be figuring out that they um, something is going on. Uh, they think that they actually, well, we don't know, but they know, but they seem to know when this is going to be happening. So we're having an upwelling condition, lots of krill all over the shelf now. Then when the wind stops or also starts to blow from the west, we suddenly see the cessation of upwelling. And when this happens, the and the wind stops blowing as well, the Alaska coastal current starts moving from the western side, and I'm just toggling back and forth, western side of the canyon towards Point Barrow, towards the eastern side of Barrow Canyon. And then if the upwelling, excuse me, if it keeps on, um, the wind stays quiet long enough, the Alaska coastal current moves right up against the, the Point Barrow and the eastern side of Barrow Canyon. And at this point, water on the Beaufort Shelf continues to move towards the west through momentum. And so all the krill um, just pile up in that location and they become very concentrated on the shelf to the north and east of Point Barrow. And now you see that the whales have moved in and are starting to feed on this hot spot of their prey. So how do we know this? Well, first we know because we, have, we caught greater numbers of krill on the shelf to the north and east of Point Barrow um, when the krill trap is on versus when the krill trap is off, as can be seen in these two slides. We also know by looking at the velocities, the, the direction and speed of the currents. And these are data collected um, along two transects using an acoustic Doppler current profiler that, we profiler that we had on our boat. And on the right, first you see the condition, a condition when the krill trap is off. This is when, when it, might be, it might be upwelling winds. And you can see that the Alaska coastal current is on the western side of the canyon and that there is water running to the southwest just off of Point Barrow. As we po I pointed out when that cloud of krill went around the corner and washed down into the Chukchi Sea along the shore. When the krill trap is on, however, you can see that the Alaska coastal current is right up against the eastern wall of the canyon and that the water on the shelf is moving either very slowly or perhaps even to the east, but it's no longer escaping around Point Barrow and entering the Chukchi Sea so that the, the water in the krill at that, on the sh shelf in that location cannot escape the Beaufort Shelf. We know also from aerial surveys, um, and this, these were aerial surveys from 84 to 2014, that there were more whales and larger groups of whales seen on the shelf when the krill trap is on, which is on the left, versus when the krill trap is off. So the whales really like to come, come onto that shelf when the krill trap is on and they can find food. And of course, um, as Craig will point out that they are also, well, I'll show that in a minute actually, but yes. So here we can see, we know also that whales on the shelf have been feeding on krill. And this ties right back into Craig's talk when he was showing us the prey in the stomachs of the whales. So this figure is from data collected during fall whaling from 2002 to 2012. Um, it was collected by the Barrow Whalers and also the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management. And Craig had a huge part of, of getting these data together. And it generally shows the numbers of whales collected, or, or excuse me, struck um, either on the shelf or off of the shelf. And for more whales were struck on the shelf than off of the shelf during this period. And 57% of the whales that were struck on the shelf contained krill, but only 39% of the whales struck off of the shelf contained krill. And of those whales on the shelf that contained krill, 67% of them were, were struck while the krill trap was on and all of them were struck after there had been upwelling winds from the east that would have been then brought, of course, krill onto the shelf. We also have information from a mooring that we put on, on the Beaufort shelf at about 20 meters depth. We had this out for some of the years of our study, it was always at about the same location and location is shown by that yellow star on our map. And from this, we looked at the backscatter from a acoustic Doppler current profi profiler now we know krill are strong dial vertical migrators. They spend the daytime at depth in the dark and then they migrate up into the upper part of the water column during the hours of darkness at night. And during August and September, what the, um, which is when we were up there and when the mooring was out, we did have a nice uh, day night signal. So it was dark at night and light during the daytime. So on the right, you can see an average backscatter signal um, while the krill trap was active. 
And you can see that there's enhanced backscatter near the surface around midnight and much lower backscatter um, near the surface during um, the periods of daylight. And this is consistent with krill migrating upwards at night and downwards when on, upon the onset of daylight. On the left, you can see the average backscatter from, for this particular deployment um, from a period of periods of time when the krill trap was not active and there is no dial vertical migration signal. So this also is consistent with the krill coming onto the shelf and being there when the krill trap is active. So I'm now going to turn it over to Steve who will be talking about interannual variability and broad scale atmospheric drivers. And Steve, I think you'll just have to tell me next slide. Okay. Uh, next slide. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> the panel on the left, uh, the gray and black panel, shows um, dial vertical migration or, or measures of dial vertical migration from that shelf mooring uh, that Karen just showed. Uh, each individual bar uh, indicates a day's average value for some index of dial vertical migration. And the point here is you can see a lot of day-to-day uh, -day variability. The lowest values around 5 dB uh, typically occurred when the winds were blowing from the east during upwelling situations. The taller bars, the greater backscatter, typically was associated with um, krill trap conditions, relaxed winds or winds from the southwest. Um, <clears throat> With respect to interannual variability, you can see the there are two years in which kind of the average um, uh, indices of dial vertical migration are greater, 2009, 2012. And <clears throat> what we did then is uh, look at the wind patterns to see if there were characteristic patterns that uh, occurred in 2009, 2012, and another grouping for the other uh, years of this deployment. And as it turns out, and uh, I saw that Yvette made a comment earlier, um, this, this little analysis was kind of motivated by a, a grad student paper of her, um, Leo Berline, uh, Yvette's grad student some time ago, uh, based on some modeling work uh, using the Naval Postgraduate School uh, uh, RASM. Anyway, um, what we found out is that we tended to see more krill um, on the shelf in late summer, early fall, when winds were from the south, the top panel. And um, the black lines enclose an area in which the correlation between those particular winds, it's uh, 9 July to um, 11 August, I believe. Um, so it's basically saying that winds over the Chukchi, the central Chukchi, if they're from the south during July and August, we're going to tend to have more krill on the shelf in Barrow uh, in late August, early September. If you look down at the bottom map, you can see that um, the arrows are small, the winds are weak, and those are so those wind conditions are associated with the other years in which. Um, Krill abundance, as inferred from the acoustic Doppler current profiler, is less. So um, the next series of slides are all going to be um, related to wind forcing. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, <clears throat> the interannual variability of whatever oceanographic or biological parameters we're going to show you here is to greater or lesser degree driven by regional large scale wind forcing. And that's the, the point I hope you walk away with here. So um, this slide basically shows <clears throat> um, a section from Point Barrow extending across Barrow Canyon to the Northwest. Uh, we occupied this every year within a couple of days of August 21st uh, for the 11 years we were up there. And you can see that some years there are warm uh, surface waters, other years, colder surface waters. And again, these conditions are uh, related to large scale uh, forcing. Uh, next slide, Karen. All right, so if we, um, we have temperature and salinity uh, from CTD cast and we can <clears throat> then characterize uh, each CTD cast, uh, identify it according to what kind of water mass it is. And 
the things to notice that are most obvious here are the green colors, which is warm Alaskan coastal water, and the purple, which is um, late season melt water. And so you can see that the more Alaskan coastal water you have tended to occur in the warm years. Uh, if you have more late season melt water, more purple stuff, that tends to occur in colder years. And melt water is associated with sea ice. Uh, let's uh, skip to the next slide. So if we have a late retreat, uh, top slide, and this is the ice edge, the 10% ice edge uh, for different conditions, uh, late retreat year in top and early retreat years in the bottom. If you have more uh, sea ice present in the Northern Chukchi in late August, you're, tending, you're going to tend to have more meltwater. If the ice retreated a little earlier, uh, you'll have less meltwater or no meltwater. <clears throat> Next slide, please. All right, so the uh, dark purple line here uh, just shows you the proportion of late season meltwater uh, on August 21st, give or take a day or two. And you can see that um, the colored boxes on, down below are characterized as um, warm years or cold years. You can also see that these other water masses, uh, Alaskan coastal water, the dotted line, uh, varies in roughly inversely with the amount of late season meltwater. Then you have Chukchi summer water and uh, winter water. Um, if you look closely at those, Chukchi summer water and winter water sometimes are also very uh, inversely. Next slide. <clears throat> And here's kind of the interesting thing, how this um, relates to the biology. Uh, Karen uh, did this uh, nice bit of analyses in which he shows that the proportion of large krill, uh, juveniles and adults, varies uh, with sea ice, the, uh, the presence of sea ice, and for that matter, uh, late season meltwater. Um, and again, uh, the the uh, retreat of sea ice is governed to greater or lesser degree by the regional winds. And so, uh, next slide. We might then surmise that um, the age structure of krill at Utgadvik, because we see this interannual variability, is, might be related to large scale interannual variability in wind forcing. And <clears throat> kind of the um, foundation or impetus for looking at this particular thing, this particular relationship goes back to this Berline paper in 2008, uh, which was basically a numerical model study. And <clears throat> it showed that uh, there tended to be two peaks of krill arrival at uh, Utkiagvik. There was one in the fall of the spawning year and there was a subsequent um, uh, pulse in the, the next year. So a year and a half after the spawning year. So <clears throat> what we want to do is search for wind patterns over the Bering, Chukchi and Beaufort seas that vary in the same, in a similar fashion as the JAD fraction, the little uh, time series you see on the right-hand side of your screen. So um, you can see that in 2006, 2009, 12, 13, and 14, the age structure of the krill tended to be biased towards larger uh, juveniles and adults. And in the other years, 2005, 7, 8, 10, 11, and 15, uh, the krill caught in the ring nets tended to be bias toward younger fracilia. Next slide, please. All right, so what we do then, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, search for a bunch, through a bunch of different combinations of um, average winds we can, and when, and different start dates. So uh, we have here, I think, 426 possible averaging windows along the x-axis and 426 um, daily start dates. 
And so 426 times 426, take half of that, that's 90, more than 90,000 possible combinations of wind forcing, both start date and duration. And the two, there were kind of two um, hot spots, uh, one of which uh, in the fall of the previous year, you can see it's more the blue and uh, teal color uh, in the fall. And statistically, the, the peak there was 28th of September to 24th of December. Uh, the other hot spot uh, was in May, 45 day period from May 1st to mid June. So these two periods <clears throat> were best correlated with um, the variability of age, krill age structure at Barrow in August and September. Next slide, please. So what do the wind patterns for these two periods look like? So the fall period, you can see that in the top panel, uh, the arrows uh, are the mean for the period, the mean direction and uh, speed. And the little reference arrow is five meters per second up at the top. The coloration is an indicator of the persistence of the wind, sort of like uh, if you, as you move towards the orange end of the scale, winds, uh, are more prevailing. If you're down at the left side, the blue end of the scale, these are very variable winds. So in the situation where we have younger krill dominate, for cilia fraction is greater than the juvenile adult fraction as in the top panel, you can see that you have strong persistent easterly and northeasterly winds over the southern Beaufort and throughout the Chukchi extending into the Bering Sea. In the lower panel, uh, the lower map, in years in which the larger krill uh, proportion is greater than the younger krill, you can see that these easterly and northeasterly winds are weaker. So um, what this means <clears throat> is that during the top uh, condition when you have strong easterlies, the uh, these easterlies move krill that are on the Chukchi shelf into the Arctic basin. If you have weaker winds, the lower situation, during the preceding fall, the krill tend to remain on the Chukchi shelf. They overwinter and mature such that, next slide, in the following spring, if you have continued easterly winds, the any remaining krill that overwintered on the shelf are pushed into the Arctic basin. However, if the winds are weak in the spring, uh, it promotes the arrival of these larger krill uh, at UTQ in the fall, and they get there before that season's brood year arrives at UTQ. Mm. Next slide. So overall, uh, bowheads stop at Point Barrow with Gyagvik because uh, dense patches of their krill prey are often trapped there. The trap is driven by local winds. The ocean conditions at Point Barrow with Gyagvik vary each year and are driven by large scale atmospheric patterns, the average winds, time averaged winds. And the proportion of large krill in late August is associated with the timing of the Chukchi Sea Ice Retreat and long term broad scale wind patterns. Um, dial, vertim, dial vertical migration and uh, water masses, water mass volumes are also associated with long-term broad scale wind patterns. So we have the two things. We have the local winds that are important for the krill trap, but structuring the, the nature of the krill um, that arrive at Barrow, that's dependent on the large scale wind patterns. Next slide, please. All right, <clears throat> so we've uh, developed this krill trap model. And so we have kind of a case study. This is, uh, shows aerial surveys and wind patterns uh, for the two month period, mid August to mid October for last year. And last year was really unusual in that, and Craig, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was only one bowhead landed at and that was in uh, mid-November. Yeah, very unusual year. 
Right. <laughs> so the, the blue line uh, indicates east-west wind speed. So positive values are winds blowing to the east from the west. Negative values are blowing from the east to the west. The horizontal line there at about minus five and a half is a rough threshold for uh, separating upwelling conditions, which are below that line, and uh, relaxed wind or krill trap conditions, which are above the line. The red numbers and the uh, red diamonds indicate the dates on which there were aerial surveys in block 12, which is roughly uh, the Cape Simpson to Barrow Canyon area. So bowheads within uh, the Barrow area. So you can see that there were a lot of surveys flown in which there were no bowheads seen. There were just uh, two instances, one in early September of six animals and then one in mid-October of one animal. The other thing to take away from this top panel is that there were very few upwelling events. There was one in early September and then kind of a, a, a weaker event in mid-September. So there were basically during the time of whaling, once you hit mid-September, there are no upwelling winds to bring krill if they were present off shelf onto the shelf. If there's no krill on the shelf, there's no reason for bowheads to be there. Let's contrast that with 2020 this year. <clears throat> Again, the blue line show uh, east-west wind velocities. And you can see that there are a number of upwelling events. That is where the blue line extends below the horizontal black line. And then following those upwelling events, the wind relaxes into the krill trap conditions. And you can see very large numbers of bowheads seen, 105 in mid-September, 73 late September, early October, 146, and then mid-October, October 15, 317 whales. And all of these are occur all of these uh, large observations are occurring after significant upwelling events. So um, yeah. <laughs> and we saw evidence on the beach as well. Uh, right. And interestingly, fall 2019 winds were uh, uh, relatively weak. They weren't strong. So that means that the 2019 brood year, krill would have uh, remained on the Chukchi shelf under ice, matured, and then were uh, subsequently evicted and, and created those uh, very large krill wash ups in the early summer. Last slide. That's it. Yep, that's it. We'd Lots like to thank everybody. To thank Lots of people think, but and uh, do we, we have any, anyone have any questions? This is Francis. I have, I have a quick question. Um, do you guys have a sense of that? That last panel was really interesting. I was wondering if you have a sense of the, if there's any thresholds in terms of the duration or strength of the upwelling winds in order to create that uh, sort of subsequent effect of all the krill and whales. You want to back up one slide? Okay. This is the one you're talking about, Francis? Yeah. Yeah. So that threshold, the horizontal line is the threshold. It's a, depending on um, um, what you used as your metric, uh, Picart uses um, salinity, changes in salinity on the Beaufort slope. And uh, he put it at about five or so, maybe five to seven. Uh, this is um, from aerial survey stuff. Uh, actually, excuse me, a mooring we had on the edge of Barrow Canyon in the early 2000s. Um, puts it about five and a half. The, based on dial vertical migration, we got a value of six. So it's kind of five, six, seven meters per second. East winds is the threshold. Okay. And do they have to last for a certain period of time? I mean, in 2019, you have that event around whatever that is, the 12th of September, and then not really any whale sightings after that. And it was not very strong and maybe just last right. day um, versus in 2020, where you had, you know, for a couple of weeks, it was pretty consistent in late August and early September. Do you have a sense of what, how much is needed there? Well, uh, that, that goes back to um, how, much, how many krill are off shelf be uh, staged to be upwelled. So if you don't have very many krill 
off shelf and that goes back to what the strength of the brew deer is and which we have no idea what that is. Um, so you, even if you have krill off shelf and you don't have upwelling winds, um, you're, you're not gonna have whales on the shelf. Conversely, right. if you have um, krill off shelf uh, or not off shelf and you have upwelling winds, you're not gonna put very many um, zooplankton onto the shelf. And again, it's right. not going to be a, a good feeding environment. So that's an aspect of variability that we don't have a good handle on. But, but it also needs to, the krill trap needs, I mean, it needs to be upwelling long enough right. for the for the upwelled krill, if indeed they're coming in, say, for example, on these troughs or, or canyons to actually get onto the shelf and be moved across the shelf to closer to shore and get over to Ujgiagbek and Point Barrow. So there has to be some period of upwelling and long enough for that water it with the krill in it to move there. So, so the other thing to remember is that it's actually wind stress, not wind velocity. And wind stress is the square of the velocity. So if you're moving from, let's say five meters per second, that's squared, that's 25. But if you're at seven, meters per second squared, that's 49, twice as much force, just moving from five meter per second wind to a seven meter per second wind. And five meters per second in kilometers is? is well, it's about, it's about 10 knots, 10 or 12 knots, somewhere in there. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Steve, I have a, a question about your opening. Um, yeah. That region also has very often uh, eddies formation at the shelf break, uh, from what I've seen. Um, would then be that up, uh, the um, eddy formation would be as important as the uh, opening, and then uh, will really trigger the how many eddies you form there. Uh, and of course, everything is related, but it might be related more also with the curl than the wind stress strengths. Um, the eddies, <clears throat> if you look in the satellite imagery, mm -hmm. there, and, and if you look at, um, say, early in the summer when there's still a bit of sea ice, you, then you can use sea ice as a visual tracer for the, for the eddy. Um, there's one particular eddy um, that when the winds are relaxed and the ACC is up against the eastern flank of the canyon, there's a, it kind of wraps around um, onto the Beaufort shelf further down, further to the east and comes back. And um, I'm trying to think. Um, you might check. Uh, the 2011 paper. Um, okay. I, I can't quite remember if there if there's a good image there, <clears throat> but that helps um, contain or aggregate krill in the at the western end of the shelf, basically. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, uh, this is Vislav here. Um, related question to the ocean impact on uh, this kill trap. Uh, schematics you're suggesting that it's all driven by winds but uh, if the water temperature from the Bering Strait is warmer or colder that will affect your sea ice and then coupling across the sea ice from the atmosphere to the ocean can you comment on this one right <clears throat> so um, the temperature itself uh, that the warmer temperatures are going to be associated with Alaskan coastal water and one of the earlier slides we showed was that in um, early retreat years, you have more Alaskan coastal water, uh, warmer, warmer conditions that <clears throat> uh, tends to be associated with smaller krill, uh, the, the fersilia. I've got a phone call we're gonna let slide here. Um, so they, all of these things are somewhat related again, they're associated with this larger differences in larger scale wind forcing. Um, the years in which there is, uh, the Alaskan coastal current is cooler are occur in years in which 
ice retreat is delayed or later, and we have more melt water. Krill are coming in with winter water and uh, Chukchi summer water, which is <clears throat> just warmed up winter water. They, so if we have more winter water, conversely, and at the same time, less Alaskan coastal water, the likelihood of there being krill, uh, more krill and uh, on the shelf is greater. So I, I'm not sure if that's answering your question. Fair enough. <laughs> So this is Danielle. I would love to allow this conversation to keep going because uh, it's a really exciting topic and it seems like there's a lot of interest. I've just been notified, however, that the Zoom room is needed by another group. So I'm so sorry Oops. to cut this short. But thank you so much to our presenters. It's a really interesting talk. It's a really wonderful project and I look forward to seeing where it goes. I want to remind everyone that um, the meeting has been recorded. So please feel free to share it among your networks. Um, to, for folks who may have missed it. And there will also be a chat feature um, on the IARPIC site. So if you return to the IARPIC Collaborations website and um, look at the page for this event, you'll be able to continue the conversation there via chat. And I uh, would encourage uh, Craig and Karen and Steve to think about if you've heard from whalers in the community about their interests in where this project might go, um, uh, I would I would love uh, for you to think about sharing some of those um, ideas in the chat um, so we can think about where um, future research might address needs of the whaling community. And then um, beyond that, uh, are, if you're aware of limitations in either the data or the analytical tools that you would need to address those questions, um, please share those uh, there as well, because that would help funding agencies think about where they might invest in the future to help continue this work. So Good thank point. you, There's everyone. Yeah. Go ahead, Craig. No, there, there's a lot of local interest, so I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the wonderful presentations and sharing uh, this legacy of the work you've been doing for many years. And thank you uh, to everyone who participated. And we look forward to continuing the conversation in the chat. <laughs>